Dear Father, we thank you for this lesson. Thank you for uh, the ability to teach it. We ask that uh, you give us clarity, concentration on your word so we can better glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we left off uh, with 2 Corinthians 10.5, still referring to our word that usually means uh, purpose or thought. And we've seen that it, it many times is referring to Satan or the schemes of Satan and what he has uh, available for us and what sometimes we become vulnerable, vulnerable to if we don't watch ourselves when we get out of the plan of God. And this verse is a little different and why I saved it for last. It says, We are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought, that's our word, captive to the obedience of Christ. So this word captive here means to capture or gain control. To take captive as in a war. To subdue and snare so this is what the truth is arming us with the ability to do. Um, we can gain control of our thoughts because of our obedience to Him. You have that ability to capture your thoughts. And I, I really think this is where winning spiritual battles begins. Uh, this is the examination of a thought. This is the process that happens before the actual decision is made. Um, and the Word of God gives us that it's a chance. It's, it's, a, it's an area that allows us to examine the thought, to capture it in route, and to parse it and to see what is entailed in this thought and is it worth it to us. Um, so we must be able to know what we think, obviously, and to analyze our own thoughts by taking them captive. And this is what this word is telling us we can do. And then we compare them up against the truth that is already in your soul, already there, must already be there to have it, any analyzing going on. There has to be truth already there living in your soul. Um, and then if that thought is deemed inadequate, unnecessary, sinful, immoral, in the wrong timing maybe, something that needs to be forgotten, something that you need to pray about and drop it, or something that is beneficial and can be small or a big victory in the plan of God. But all those things come into play when we take captive these thoughts. And I might add it doesn't necessarily have to be a sinful thing. It could be something that you need to stop thinking about. That's part of the analyzation process that we have available to us. When you're in tune with God's Word, you can analyze differently than except thinking and making a thought. It, it, it's different for us. We, there are repercussions to our thoughts. There's things that happen afterwards, and you're in a very good place if you haven't got to the afterwards yet. I mean, I'm speaking now specifically about a, a bad or a negative thought within the plan of God. That's a good place to be in the capture phase. So either way, we should be taking our thoughts captive. So part of us conforming to the image of Christ means that we must align with Him. Align, we align with His thoughts. And that's really what we are in the capturing phase that that's why we do that is because we have our own thought patterns and the Word of God gives us a different thought pattern and that's the conforming that's what the word alive and powerful does for you in your life it can it changes you as a person so uh, and there's always a good thought that stays in alignment with God's plan and then there's can be a bad thought that goes against it. And I'm not including sin here, uh, but I just wanted to let you know that you can hinder yourself from wasting time. It may not necessarily be a, an outright sin. It could be an underlying sin. But we need to be able to analyze these types of decisions that we make before we make them. And that really goes back to 
um, you know, letting Christ rule in your heart, in your soul. That's winning spiritual battles in the mind. And the results of that are right decisions that are not based on lies are those that lead you away from God. And there's plenty of those out there. There's plenty of those decisions that we can grab. We can convince ourselves that this is a good decision. When the reality of it, the truth of it is, it's really not. Even though it looks to be on the outside, it appears that way. Remember, that's part of Satan's job. So this word that we've been talking about is noema, which means a thought or purpose, which I already talked to you about. And it's directly related to Satan and his schemes, his lies, his ability to blind and deceive, assist in hardening process to numb someone from understanding anything in the spiritual realm. And, but notice these are all things that I wanted to go through every one of these verses because every single one of these are included in the guarding process. We do not have to worry about any of that. As long as you keep doing what you're doing. Stay positive. Have a hunger for the Word of God. And that guarding is in place. You're fortified. If you've ever talked to someone going back to this, this blindness, this effect that Satan has on believers uh, and unbelievers can get in this, this kind of a callous blindness on them. If you ever talk to someone like that, you know what I'm talking about. Because when you mention anything spiritual, they kind of just kind of just blank out. They check out. They, they may even change the subject really quickly. They don't, it doesn't calculate. Not, there's no thought. It just kind of bounces off of them. That's that hardening process that has taken effect that the truth no longer is, is perceived if they're a believer. And if they're an unbeliever, well, remember, the gospel is the only thing that's going to penetrate that. That's the, the Holy Spirit that takes care of that. But I just wanted to point that out because it's very obvious when you know someone who is negative and you keep giving spiritual information and they're not seeing it. As a matter of fact, they'll look in other places while speaking to you about that very topic. They'll be going around that spiritual to get to the physical solution instead of the that's that blindness. That's looking in the world versus the real solutions to solve the problem. Satan. He does it. He's good at it. So don't take him for granted uh, because he's a lot smarter than we are. And he knows what he's doing. He's been around a lot longer than we have. So that, that's that hardened look or the blindness of truth. And that even goes to us if we, if we slip off the plan of God. You know, we can easily overlook good advice, good sound doctrinal advice because of a lack of truth in our souls. That doesn't take much to happen to us either. You can get good advice. You can give good advice to a, a growing believer that has fallen off slightly and they won't see its benefit. They can't see it. Just because they're just not on this path anymore, they've, they've gone just a little bit detoured. And you have a little more wisdom to show them that, hey, maybe, you know, and part of that's, of course, the growing process as believers. But you get the point that we can fall for other things besides truth very quickly. So... Um, but, you know, the realization is that even though we may fall for these things and those around us may look to those things and solely look to those things, the physical for solutions, we have to realize that there's absolutely nothing that they can provide you that can give any solution whatsoever. They're very temporary. They're very fleeting. And they've been painted to look good in the eyes of the unsuspecting. So, 
So God is guarding us against falling for Satan's backdoor ways to get at the Christian. Every single one of them. And there's a lot of evil in this world, as I already mentioned, but God is guarding us from it all when we have this peace and thanksgiving within us. So, you know, it really just goes to show you who's in charge, doesn't it? It goes to show you no matter how fear, fearful, worry, anxiety, what you can think about when it comes to evil or Satan, it goes to show you that that could just be put to a stop. There's no need to even worry about what Satan is doing, whether it be in this world, whether it be in your country, your state, your city. There's no need to worry. Because if you continue to grow exactly like you're doing, that's where the guarding effect comes in. That's the barrier that you have available. And also the captive, you know, take your thoughts captive. That's part of the winning in daily life in your decision process. So we should never worry about what Satan's doing, if he's doing it, when he's doing it, because he's subordinate to God. You say, well, I know that, Scott. Well, we need to live that way. We need to think that way. We'd be a lot less worried uh, if we did. So Satan is powerless to the, un to the believer who is being guarded in their heart. And mine. So the peace of God in your soul from Thanksgiving, uh, it reminded me of, uh, you know, the wicked witch having poured water on her. That's what this is like to Satan. He's defenseless to it. Everybody's thinking, what a world, what a world. That's what Satan's yelling when you have this guarding around you. It, he can't do anything. He just melts him. Because when you're guarded by God himself guess who's going to get you nobody except if you allow it remember we have our own volition our own decisions our own responsibilities as christians and part of that means that's the maintenance process that we just talked about remember we've got to maintain keep spraying so and and as we go through this you, you should be thinking that where the power is it's within you this is what we have this is the contentment this is part of that contentment remember we're still talking about contentment we're flowing through that process and now we're talking about guarding when we're content that's what gives you contentment is security the security of your own life your family your everything about what happens on this earth that's a secure uh, a mindset that only happens through this right here. That's the contentment that we're referring to. And see, that's why Satan wants just the opposite. Because when you're not content, you're discontent. And you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. And Satan knows that. He's not dumb. He knows that that contentment, you're not looking for anything external. You're not looking for solutions in the physical. He can't touch you. He can't access you. You're guarded by the truth, by God himself. So what does he try to do? Disrupt that contentment. And he'll throw a wrench by God's permission in your life that will try to disrupt, disrupt that contentment. So he wants no peace he wants you to worry. He wants you to be frustrated. You notice because when you're not happy is when Satan can gain a foothold in your life, in the back door. That's why I referred to it as the back door because it's a way to access that we're kind of unsuspecting. We're in a state where we may be searching for something in our lives that's really not attainable because we're outside of the spiritual realm here. And Satan, that's Satan's area. He knows you're not content. He knows you're not satisfied. So when we are like that, we can be vulnerable because the world gives you plenty of solutions and they want to satisfy your needs like no tomorrow, but they're not going to do it. They're just going to get you further from the plan of God, further and further and further. 
So we need to be careful because Satan, Satan will sneak in those back doors because you're looking for solutions in the wrong places. And he has a funny way of being in those, all those wrong places. Just waiting for the unsuspecting believer who has gotten off the path. So, and he's always waiting, it seems like, with just the right things. Just what you were looking for in the moment. You know, he's, he's, he's sanded it, he's buffed it out, he's repainted it, he's repackaged it. He's made it just the way you like, just what you've been thinking about. And there it is. See, these things are not an accident. Uh, remember who's in control here. Not Satan. God. Don't ever forget that. Just because Satan gets to have fun on this earth and play a little bit in the playground with us doesn't mean that he has any control. But he does. He is allowed to test. He is allowed to deceive he is allowed to see uh, our, our history run its course. God does allow him to roam the earth. So there's certain things that come into play and it all focuses on your volition. That's why Satan is allowed to do so much because it depends on a choice. The battle must depend on a choice. If God told you to choose one way, it wouldn't be a fair game. It's got to be perfectly fair if it has anything to do with God's plan, and it does. So it relies on your decisions, your decision process. So Satan, he likes an attractive and deceptive lure. That's what it reminded me of, fishing lure. But he never has the live bait. He never does, ever. But it always looks just like it. It always looks very, very close to it. You know, like the fish, they'll bite anything. Some of them won't, but some of them will. And that's kind of like you as an immature or believer off track. See, you can see something and it not be the real thing, and you go for it. And that's why one, that one decision we made can get us so far off the plan of God because we were unhappy. We weren't content. We were in that gray area where Satan's just kind of waiting. He's waiting on us to get there so he can just provide something on a platter that just looks great. Like in the cartoon, you see the big silver thing come off with the big chicken leg or the turkey sitting in there, the chicken. And we see it and we say, well, let me go, you know, cut a leg off. We can't do that. We've got to be in tune. We've got to be in tune so you're not distracted. So you're guarded. Because these things are very, very, very subtle. And I mean so subtle that you don't realize it's happening because you're just frustrated and complaining about your situation in life. So you're blinded. You're not in, really in, in touch with what's happening. You're just upset and frustrated. That's, not, that's a dangerous place to be. That's unstable. Because when we're in that state, we, we, you know, we look at these things that Satan has and we say, well, it looks right. It, it's what I've been kind of wanting. I mean, it fits the, you know, it'll relieve, it'll make me happy. And then that's where our judgment gets a little bit dull. That's that satanic effect, the dulling of your senses, I guess you could say. Dull. It's a good word for it. They're not as crisp as they were when you were in tune and not frustrated. So, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. This is a good one about Satan. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Well, there's a good analogy. An angel of light. That's what he is. But he's a bad one. Remember, God created Satan. He was an angel of light, but now he's an angel of darkness. So what he has to do to overcorrect, over 
go the opposite direction is perceive or have a perception to be an angel of light, of good. It's a good thing. It's okay. It's okay to go that way. It's okay to make that decision. But see, that's the, the deception of that light. It's not good. And the only way we're going to pick up on it that it's not good is to see it when you're in that state of discontentment. Because if you don't see that, that's the spot where you're going to get kicked. Right there. He looks the part and plays the part, but he's not the part. So when we get frustrated or worry about what you have or don't have, be careful. Because you can make some of the worst decisions of your life, even as a growing believer. And that's why we must take every thought captive. Even when you're frustrated, things aren't going right, the circumstances aren't what you thought they'd be with the white picket fence and the, you know, you got to wake up. Satan's waiting on that kind of stuff. Notice that our phrase, will guard, is a future active indicative. So when you combine the future tense with the indicative mood, the indicative mood, remember, is the mood of reality. This is saying that this will happen. Will guard your hearts. Future tense, mood of certainty, we could call it. This is something that will happen without a doubt. God is guaranteeing it. In other words, we've been told. We know where the guarding is. We know where the safety net is. Let's take advantage of it. Because guess what? We all get frustrated. We all get to the point where we say, I'm tired of this. We all get to the point where we're vulnerable in life. Because we're human. But if we're in tune that guarding process can prevent something that wasn't ever supposed to happen. Because you can prevent it by staying consistent in the Word of God. And that's encouraging to me. Just keep doing what you're doing. There's nothing that's going to come and hit you in the side or behind the back because you weren't. As long as you are continuing down the road of spiritual maturity, you have nothing to worry about. Future active indicative will guard without a doubt. So that's the future indicative. So we can know for certainty that his protection in these areas will never go away if we choose to accept the protection and remain positive to his plan for our life. So that's our buffer. We do have a buffer. God protects us from this world in more areas than we can even imagine. We've got a buffer. And notice at the end what it says at the end and back in our verse. I don't know if did I come back. No, that's the next verse. It, at the end of that it said, we'll guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Now that is a given. That's what who you're conforming to. That's the mind we have in written form. Remember, that's the personal journal, the mind of Christ. So the only way to have inner peace or any protection of the mind is with the very words of Christ. That's it. The truth. The very words of Christ, which simply translates to the mind of Christ, which we have at our fingertips. You know, it's really amazing to me to think about what we have in print on a piece of paper. That's what we have. That's what God has given us to the completed canon of Scripture on paper. It's in a book. There's a reason it's the most popular book in the world. Because it's not just, you know, words on a paper. It's words that change people's lives. It's words that do just what we've been talking about. Guard, defend, ha allow you to have peace in your life, in your soul, even when things tell you otherwise. That's what we have available to us. Has the highest annual sales from any other book in the world, the Bible. So 
in order for us to make any of these things work correctly in Christ, we have to live up to our responsibilities. We have to. We've got to. I mean, I, I cannot push that hard enough. You, you have to. Once you leave here, you've got to play your part. You've got to do your part. It's not just about 30 minutes or an hour or two hours a day or even three hours a day if you do that many. It's about what happens after that. You soak it in, you soak it in, you soak it in, and then you're back in the mix. You're in the world. You're in real life situations. You're in difficulties, problems. That's where this responsibility comes in. We've got to carry this stuff through. We've got to learn it and we've got to carry it through. We're living in a world, that, in, in a country, there's no application. Application is, is not even something that's real to people. This is a reality that it must be taken from the pages of Scripture, the guarding, and brought to our lives, to whatever situation you're in to whatever you may be worried or discontent about guarding. Think about what God does through you. He guards. We need to apply that. We need to take it personally. And, and there's always that faith aspect that comes into there. Remember, we got to believe it. If you don't believe the words, it's not a reality. It can't be. It's not real. You won't live it out. You'll just believe it. You may even say it. You may even know it. But if it's not a belief that's rooted in the faith that actually gives it over to God, it's not going to happen. He, he wants to live your life. He wants to guide and protect and guard and give you that happiness. But you have to allow Him to do so. That's part of the responsibility. So this is what we have available to us. And just what I've been saying, this should be a given. If, if everybody wants the results, but they have to have the right input if you want the results. You've got to. And we at least know the source of the input is all I'm telling you. We know that where it is. We know where it's found. We're positive to it. We've got the right idea. So, and we all want the output. We all want to glorify. We all want to grow to spiritual maturity and die and be confident at our death and at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what we want because we're going to blink and this life is going to be gone. So we want to live up to this output that I'm referring to, to that full, total responsibility of seeing the word through. You got to. You should want to. So, verse 8. So it says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So finally, brothers, brothers and sisters, you might see in the NIV. I think it's the NIV that does it. Maybe the net. Some of them put brothers and sisters, but that's really what it's referring to. Nothing wrong with that. It's a masculine word, though. So Paul is basically, he's kind of coming to a conclusion. Finally. This word finally means that there's something remaining that I need to tell you. Wait, there's something left. It's also translated more so or more over. Or in other words, wait, there's more. I need to tell you a little bit more. So, moreover, brethren, um, but this is kind of the end of Paul's imperatives. So, I, uh, me and Paul are going to stop yelling at you. There's no more imperatives. There is one more at, at the very last, I think it's the last verse. Um, it says, greet every saint. The greet is a command in 421. There's only one more. But see, we're, we're tapering off. It says, finally. There's a little some more I want to tell you. So here's, here's the second to last command. It says in our verse, dwell on these things. 
And I mention it first because if we're going to dwell on them, we ought to know what we're going to that what we need to do before we see what to do, right? Well, the command is to dwell on what we're about to talk about. All that means is the word to dwell means uh, it can be translated to reckon or to consider, and it means to give careful thought to a matter, to think about, to ponder, to let one's mind dwell on. If whatever you're dwelling on, by the way, you're living your life by. That's the reality of it. That's why it says dwell on these things. An extended period of thought about what's here. That's why I wanted to title this something about a righteous Christian. The righteous Christian. Not self-righteous. This is the holiness that we're referring to. As we, that we conform to. And we should begin to think with these individual components. And every one of them we're going to go through. The word even means reason to a logical conclusion. So in your mind, these should logically be the things that you think about because you've considered them as truth and you know them to be sound. The word of God and they work. And you've heard this word before. It also means to calculate or determine by a mathematical process. And that really doesn't apply here, but it, if you want to think about it that way, we could talk about how we think about them and their comparison to other thoughts they don't mathematically compare there is no comparison so in a way it does so these are the things that we must dwell on that's the command come to a logical conclusion that we think about falls into these categories Paul's referring to so Notice that he's not saying this. He's not saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. He's not giving us a bullet list of what not to do. What he's doing here is he's saying, I'm going to give you some principles, some guidelines on what the righteous Christian thinking dwells on. This doesn't have to be a checklist, but it does need to be something that we really consider hard because I think it is uh, there's a certain reason and an order of this list that we may need to note a few things on he starts off with the most important one in the list whatever is true Isn't that what we've been talking about truth the Word of God what is true the word means that which is not hidden or concealed by its nature it stresses the undeniability of reality when something is fully tested, shows as fact or authentic. That's truth. This is the things that he's saying. He starts off the verse, whatever is true, dwell on these things. Facts, authentic, fully tested. So it's kind of funny though. Anything that is false has to be concealed has to be hidden, has to be painted with a different picture. That's not, it's, isn't it the complete opposite of truth? It's fully tested. It's clear. It's well uh, known fact that it works. You've got to, you know, when it comes to false, the reason it has to be hidden because if it's going to be believed, if a false is going to be believed as true, it's got to be concealed. Doesn't it? That's just the nature of the beast. So you can imagine if Satan, the great deceiver, if he is giving it his best shot to convince people that his way is best, well, guess what? You can imagine that that's going to not look like a lie. It's not going to look bad. It's not going to look like it's going to deceive you. It can't. Because the goal is to for you to believe it. Take the bait. That's like a lure. You know, you want to fake the fish out. Yeah, okay, that looks like a real frog. But it's not really, but you want them to think it is. That's Satan. He's fishing. So, and they really have to, you know. It sounds good on the surface if people are going to believe whatever falsehood he is promoting. And don't we have a lot of that today? Things that are not facts or authentic, but being presented as 
facts and authentic. We see it all the time. This is a fact. The research has been done, no and no, but it's being presented that way. Look, the numbers show it, see, see, see? No, it hasn't. There, you know, there's lots of people that are living lives that are detached from truth, detached from truth. Because the only source of truth for anyone in the absolute sense is the one we're speaking about biblically. <coughs> Jesus Christ, the Word, His Word. So I think this is why Paul puts this word first. And it's also the only noun in the list that has a verb with it. Kind of interesting. Look at this. The English translations add the ones in yellow, but they're not there in the Greek. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. But I wanted to show you, it, it comes across, it's easier to understand when you add is for us in the English. We like to equate, it's an equated verb, the verb of being. Amy is the verb. But the green one is the only one that's there. And I think that's to emphasize uh, the verb of being. Whatever is true. That's, we need to make that calculation before anything else comes after that because if you don't pass the truth test none of these uh, nothing else after this is going to fly nothing honorable see it's got to be true if it's honorable and, and that applies to lovely if it's not true it's not that lovely and you see this a lot uh you see this a lot with this type of thing. I'm not saying this is, you know, bad translation. The Greek does that because sometimes it's easier to understand when we throw an is in there. And it's easier for me to say it. I could say whatever right, but that doesn't really make sense. It's whatever is right. So here's what it looks like in the Greek if any of you are interested. See the word in red at the very top? That's your is. And then all the pink hasas are whatevers. Those are all your whatevers. There's no is in any of them, except for truth. Alethe, that very top one. And then there's our command. There's that fire I was telling you about that I see when I see a command. That's the fire that jumps out at me. There's our command on the very bottom. So anyways, I see all your eyes are kind of rolling. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that. Sometimes you can see things differently in different ways. But uh, So I think the reason Paul is doing this is because the Christian way of life starts and ends with truth. That's what we do. That's what we live by. That's what we decipher this world from. That's how we pass spiritual tests, how we win spiritual. Everything is, everything is truth based on truth. That's how we base our decisions, how we glorify God. This is a minor point in the Greek, but I think it's a major point in our day and in the Philippians day as well. There must have been an issue with truth. We've got an issue with truth, too, in our country. We've got an issue with truth. No one seems to like the things that work or the things that are proved, tested. But we've got a serious issue here. So it's, it's a valid point. The verb goes with truth. It's that important. It takes the verb. It's the only one that gets it. So, and you know, that, that even goes to show that even though you seek the truth, it's definitely not the most popular option in Satan's world. You seek the truth. And there's other positive believers like you, of course. But that's not the popular option. That's not the popular option. It's not the most widespread. But it is readily and easily available. It is. It, you notice that? It, it's always available. God always provides us with His Word and a way, a means to access and grow spiritually. He does. If you are positive, He will find you some spiritual food. He will. He will. And that goes with anybody. If you're positive, he will find it. So it's available. 
So the only other option to living by truth is to live according to the false. And we talked about that. But the false is excluded immediately from Paul's list, right from the get-go. So some examples uh, I've already mentioned of the, you know, some of these things that are, are false, but some of the things that are supposedly tr proven um, and are really false, or some of them are interesting. Like I already mentioned the environmentalism. And I'm not saying trash your planet. You know, take care of the planet. I don't, I don't mean to say that. Um, but how about, here's another one. How about that happiness can be found in many places besides your relationship with Christ? That's a popular one. You can spend a lot of time on that one. Um, how about love? What about love? Love based on looks? Love based on sex? <coughs> Love based on the physical? It's not really. How about sex before marriage? That it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's not anything wrong with that. That's, that's part of that. That lie. How about there's many pathways to God? So, these are the kind of things that we need to learn how to exclude right from the get-go as false. Exclude. Get a drink of water, Pat, please, sir. So, and we could go on and on about this, but you get the point. Satan's system is based on lies, and lies must always be concealed with lots of pretty things around them. So, then we have whatever is, oops, whatever is honorable. There's actually three other instances of this word, and I think we should briefly look at all three to get a better idea of what it means. I don't normally do that, but when I don't have a lot to go off of about a word, you got to go back to the scripture to get your meaning because even the definition, if they, you know, they don't have a lot to go off. They have history, but if we have three or five verses to look through about what the word means, I think it's a good idea to see what they look like. So the first one is 1 Timothy 3.8. This is our word, honorable. It says, deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity. There's your word, honor. Not double-tongued. So, the comparison here is between what the deacons should be, which is our word, honor, against what they shouldn't be. And the first word being double-tongued. This is double-tongued. All right, everybody can leave except the deacons. No, I think this is actually applies to, to all of us. The word double tongue means two sayings, literally. It means deceitful by saying one thing but meaning another. Double speaking. It mean, it's describing someone leaving a deliberate misimpression or acting like a spiritual weather vane by reversing their position taking different sides of an issue whenever it is convenient or expedient. You see what this means. So the person is unstable, vacillating, speaking out of both sides of their mouth. By the way, our deacons are not that way. But I'm just pointing it out. They wouldn't be qualified if they were. And then it, were, it says... Oh, it also means saying one thing and meaning another and making different representations to different people about the same thing. I thought that was kind of interesting. It says, or addicted to too much wine. Uh, this word doesn't focus on quantity. It means to hold to, to turn to, to attend to, to give full attention, to set a course and keep it, to devote oneself. See, this is a mental process. That's what alcohol does to you. It's a mental process. It may not be the quantity, but it's, it, it's what happens in your mind. How do you perceive it? Look what it says, to hold, to turn to, to attend to, to give full attention. There's a lot of times we can turn to that as a stress reliever, 
Um, and if you turn to it every day, you just have to be careful. I'm not saying that there's necessarily anything wrong with alcohol. There is, of course, with, with drunkenness, but um, this is referring to a mental thing. Not addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain. This, is, this just means gravitating towards gaining a profit immorally. And in verse 9, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So honor is associated with the doctrine that we're learning that is revealed to us and also a clear conscience. And then, of course, we can't exclude the ladies. Got y'all too. 1 Timothy 3.11, women must likewise be dignified. There's your word, honor. Not malicious gossips. Uh-oh. Malicious gossips. This word means to engage in slander with the communication of false or malicious statements that damage the reputation of another person. So, that is not honorable. It's not honorable to speak about something that might affect someone's reputation in a negative way. Anything. That can be anything. That can be from a minor point to a major point that disrupts lives. Anything that detracts from their reputation needs to be withheld. And then it says, but temperate. And that just means to be sober or not intoxicated. Clear-minded, free from life-dominating influences. Oh, they had to throw that in there. Not just alcohol. Free from life-dominating influences. And then it says faithful in all things. I like how it includes every single thing. Faithful in all things. In life. Live your life in a faithful way. Whether, not specifically referring to a husband or even your relationship. Just live everything, in, in all things, faithful. Just a couple more. And then older men, Titus 2.2, 2, are to be temperate. There's our word. You could say honorable. Older men are to be honorable. Or no, sorry. Older men are to be temperate and then our word, honorable. The word temperate here means to be the same word as above. To be sober, not intoxicated, clear-minded, free from life-dominating influences. Okay? Sensible. This means self-controlled. Self-controlled. Divinely balanced as defined by the Word of God. See, you guys should be spiritual gentlemen. That's a good word. Divinely balanced as defined by the Word of God. And then it says sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. See how the bar is going higher for the older men? There's more expected. There's more expected because they're growing, they're maturing. I mean, this is talking about love. It's talking about perseverance, faith. Sound here, sound in faith. Sound means to be healthy, pure, good working order. And then you have love in perseverance. And we know what perseverance means. It means remaining under endurance, steadfastness, especially as God enables the believer to remain under the challenges he allots in life. That's to the older men, but I guarantee you that relates to us too. Every single bit of it. They're just more required. God knows that you all are growing more and it comes to a point in our lives where, hey, we're maturing in age and also spiritual growth. So we've got to, to live up to these expectations as we move forward. So, and that's a good place to stop. Next time we'll pick up with whatever is right. Whatever is right. So let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that we can... Uh, continue down this road to maturity. Ask that you help us 
guide us and we know that you'll guard us if we just maintain a positive flow of your word. Thank you for these things. We ask them in Christ's name. Amen.